Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the show. Today we have Cindy and Dan Lobb on. This is kind of a unique episode. Um, so far in the podcast, we've had professional doubles players and uh, ATP and WTA coaches. And today we have uh, two league players from Atlanta who reached out and um, uh, watched a lot of the videos on YouTube that we do and uh, have really kind of changed the way they play doubles. So Cindy and Dan, welcome. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Well, Yeah. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, and the reason I reached back out after you sent that really nice email, Cindy, was uh, because I thought this is just a perfect case study that the audience can relate to uh, as far as um, what strategy can do for you in doubles. Um, I feel like so many people are focused on technique and hitting a bigger serve or a bigger forehand. And in your email, you illustrated, and I want to dive really deep into this, how changing your strategy can make as big or probably a bigger impact than focusing on things like technique. Um, so to start out, uh, just tell us the story of why you, uh, emailed me in the first place and why you reached out. Sure. I'll go. So, um, I'm relatively new to tennis. So I learned to play tennis in my forties. So definitely, um, you know, wish I had learned younger, but when Dan, Dan's been playing longer than me, but what would happen is we would go out on the court and I would quickly get identified as the weaker player. And then it would just be game over. They would target me and, you know, that would be the end of it. Um, compounding that in Atlanta, there's a lot of tennis leagues that are neighborhood based. So the way the leagues work, um, it's an average rating based on the neighborhood. So our neighborhood was at a higher level than I really should have been playing at. So we kept going out for these tennis matches that from my perspective, just felt like abusive tennis because mm -hmm. I was very unqualified to be there. And we spent a lot of time doing lessons, trying to get our strokes. And when I would play matches, I would be really focused on what I needed to do better. And it just never was working because I couldn't scale my skill as fast as I needed to, to be able to play at the level we were at. And so, um, Dan, found your podcast and he's like, tells me about it. And he's like, I found this new, new guy. We got to watch him. And we watched all of your videos. And, um, the next match we played, we walked out there and we're like, all right, what are we going to do? And, um, we're like, we're going to follow Will's advice. And a huge thing for me was how I really needed to be much closer to the net. I wasn't aggressive enough. I was also a lot of um, your advice about being afraid to let people pass me down the alley. Like I was definitely playing a combination of how can my game get better and fear-based tennis. And after watching your videos, I transitioned to, I don't care so much about how can I do better, but how can I make you do worse? And it really made a huge difference. And we played that whole match really aggressively. And we won that match in two sets. And I was so excited that I was like ready to pay you whatever amount of money you needed for having gotten us over the hump. And I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I mean, it was just very impactful, like right away, just because, you know, it things that you said in the videos just kind of just really stick in our minds when we're on the court too. It's like, sometimes I'll feel myself just moving my feet, but not really moving laterally on the court. And, um, you know, so today, like we really apply a lot of those, those things to our matches and we're moving at the net constantly. Um, you know, we're just attacking the net as much as possible. Um, and like last night we played a match and after we, we lost in three sets, sadly, but, um, they were really good, uh, competitors and it was, I think we played for almost three hours. Yeah. Um, but after the match, uh, the woman was like, you guys were like really crazy at the net. Uh, we just kept tell telling each other, avoid them at the net, avoid them at the net. Cause every time we would attack the net we would put the ball away yeah. and they were nervous about it. Yeah. Yeah. It was awesome. really nice. Yeah, that'll drive pe people crazy, won't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, and go ahead. One last thing. The other yeah. big thing was the way that you showed other amateurs and walked us through what they were doing wrong visually 
it gets mm-hmm. stuck in my head where I was like, I don't want to be that girl that's not moving and just like jumping up and down. So I think about that when I'm out there and that kind of helps as well. Yeah, for right. some reason that really resonates watching average players mm-hmm. that, that you're critiquing and you know giving pointers. Like we've watched countless videos about like the Brian brothers and stuff. And it's like, those points are happening so fast and their skill yeah. levels are so <laughs> different from ours. It's like, it's hard to apply what you're seeing. But when you watch like yeah. your videos with players our level, it's like, oh, the light bulb goes on yeah. and you're like, okay, that's me right there, you know? Right. Yeah, so those are those are the point of the week videos. So we'll we'll link to those in the show notes for anyone listening. Um, it sounds like there's two things or two big things so far that helped a lot uh, that you mentioned. One is uh, Cindy playing closer to the net. So I guess you were playing a little closer to the service line before. Yeah, I definitely. I think I had gotten past advice that, especially for mixed doubles, if the, especially the men are hitting at me with pace, since remember, I tended to be the target practice recipient because I was the weaker person on the court to back up, to give myself more time. But what that did was it just increased my error rate because it's so much harder to make a volley from back there. So now following your advice, I really force myself to be close, even if they're hitting with pace and I'm willing to miss the ball. And he knows sometimes like I might go and like, it'll just, it'll be too fast and he'll back me up more, but being closer to the net, my accuracy at the net went way up. Like I never considered myself a strong net player in the last three matches that I played people have said to me after the match you were so strong at the net I couldn't get past you at the net and I'm like wow. I'm not strong at the net but thank you for thinking so right. yeah you, and I think the other them. thing <laughs> yeah and um the other thing too is I have a weak serve and so that was another huge disadvantage but Dan has been able to be much more aggressive at the net on my serve using your advice yeah, really just uh, pinching the middle really hard when she's serving and mm-hmm. forcing them to try to go down the line. And I mean, on a, at like an average match, I think like seven or eight balls are going into the net uh, on the alley side because right. they, they're going for it and they're just not hitting it high enough to get over the net. Right. And how many times do they actually pass you down the line? I mean, on average, it's like only once or twice a match. Okay. Yeah. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty good ratio. Seven yeah. for, yeah. for two winners. Okay. So, um, so back to the, the net play, that's, that's definitely like striking a balance, right? If uh, you want to play closer to the net, but if, you know, if, if I were playing and Jack sock was on the other side of the net hitting four hands, I probably would need a little more time, right? Cause it's <laughs> like 90 miles an hour. So it's striking this balance of, uh, playing closer to the net to uh, a force more errors, right? Because they feel that pressure, they feel you on the net, so they're gonna try to swing bigger. And then B, if you're on top of the net, you don't really have to swing at your volleys; you just have to get a racket on it, yeah. right? So I'm sure you've noticed that uh, you probably hit a lot more volleys off your frame while you're up there too, mm-hmm. and some of those go over, mm-hmm. and they end up being a winner. And it, you know, <laughs> it's because you're in the right position, right? Yeah. Even if you, even if you had a bad volley, it's, it's a, um, that positioning really can help, but you're right. If there's too much pace, maybe you do back off a little bit and it's finding kind of that balance. Yep. Yeah. And I do think that the other thing you brought up playing close to that, we did play a match where we tried to be too aggressive at the net and then they just started really lobbing us very Mm -hmm. successfully. So, um, I think that was another recent evolution too, is that, we can't just play one match with one strategy. It's this like constantly tweaking, sure. tweaking our strategy, which I think we do better about since watching your videos as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like a game of chess, right? So you, you know, they're, they're beating you down the middle. So you play more aggressively at the net, then mm-hmm. they adjust and start lobbing. So then you have to play maybe with one back or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the other part of our game that's really changed now is we're constantly having dialogue during the match about what we're seeing them doing and how they're adjusting and what we should do in response. And like sometimes like for me, that's the biggest challenge, like uh, really trying to observe what their weaknesses are or what's working well for them and then how we should be reacting to it. Um, 
because sometimes I get in my head about just trying to do my own thing well and forget to to be observant about what's you know where their strengths and weaknesses are right right absolutely so uh you mentioned cindy you you have uh serving's not your strength and you i would imagine you had trouble holding serve a lot of the time talk about some adjustments y'all made on that um you said dan you move a little bit more at the net um yeah. talk a little bit about that anything else that y'all have uh, made adjustments on I think I'm getting so much more comfortable at the net. I serve in volley now where I never served in volley before. Um, so that has helped with um, opponents that have really good angled shots. Like I can get those much easier now because I'm already moving up and up there. Um, we were doing a lot of like planned. He was going to cross and poach and I would cross on the other side to pick up the alley. We were doing that a lot last night. Um, I think those are the two big things I think that we've been doing and just him really, he's just super aggressive. And, up I, there. and I just, I move a lot while she's serving, um, mm -hmm. uh, when I'm at the net, just trying to distract and yeah. try to tease them to, uh, you know, tempt them to go down the line as much as I can. Mm -hmm. So I'll do a lot of faking. Um, like she said, last night I was doing full poaches and she was ready to go and cover that alley. Nice. And you feel like you're holding a lot more often? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's made yeah. a huge difference. Awesome. So, so what uh, you talked about how the, the neighborhood or, or the mm -hmm. matches are based on the skill level of the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, what, what skill level do you all have USTA ratings or what? Do, do so we play, or? yeah, we play Atlanta leagues. So the closest we would be like a 3 0 USTA. 3 -0, okay. Yeah. So three oh Dan could probably play three five, but um, I pull him down a little bit. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I mean it's yeah. so then um, you know the so the the neighborhood league the the best players it's kind of like you I guess USTA yeah it works that way where the best players are at the first line yeah and mm -hmm. then the weakest are the the end of the line yeah and so the big league in Atlanta is Alta which is the Atlanta Lawn and Tennis Association and so they are the the, the divisions are A B C and then within A B and C there's level one through eight so A1 is the highest C8 is the lowest and um, we're on a high B level team, like uh, yeah. B3. Um, and so our line one players are probably 4-0 players, you know, 4 4 and then, you know, all the way down. But you get a big variety in the team because it's uh, five lines play every weekend. So 10 people play um, every weekend. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it does introduce you to definitely a lot of diversity you don't know what to expect when you walk out for an all to match um so sometimes you know line five the lowest line can you know it can you can still run into it. if the neighborhood has a really deep bench of 4-0 players you're yeah. playing a much higher level tennis sure and you said before um i copied this quote from uh, your email you said before you were playing a bunch of these matches and you described them as brutal and you felt defeated. Oh yeah. Um, I felt now you're beating those same teams. Is that right? Yes. Yes. You are? yes. Okay. Yeah. Like well, I, yeah, I got to the point that I was just like, forget it. We need to find a different Alta team where I feel like at least I'm not going to get abused when I go out mm -hmm. to play tennis. And um, we feel hundred percent. I feel hundred percent competitive now. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it feels much better when we take the court. Like we actually have a plan now yeah. in our heads of yeah. what how we're going to approach it, and then and then change based on what we're seeing. Um, and it could just gives us a lot more confidence yeah. going in. And then after the fact, whether we win or lose, like we felt so far, we have felt very competitive. Yeah, and, and then we yes. usually have some things that we're talking about after the fact that we're like, oh, we can yeah. tweak this, or we should watch, uh, you know listen to another podcast from Will or watch another video from Will and see if he covered that. Like we lost, mm -hmm. I, I was, I think it was a men's match. I lost a 10 point tie break. And uh, I, I, that was like the same day you dropped that, the 10 point tie break uh, uh, podcast. Sure. <laughs> you yeah, wish yeah. it had dropped a little earlier. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I've lost a few tiebreakers myself recently, so I I kind of created that for myself as much as anybody else. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it was uh, my partner and I both double faulted in the in the tie break, and I know you covered that. And it was like we just got stiff, like just yeah. with uh, you know concentrating so much and feeling the pressure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that happens to everybody. So, um, so we've talked about net play serve strategy. Uh, any adjustments on returns that y'all have made? I, so I, I'm doing two things, um, a lot more now. So, um, one is if I'm, if I'm going down the line, I'm, I'm aiming for the net player's backhand. Um, mm. you know, instead of targeting the alley itself, I'm giving myself a little bit more margin and I'm going towards their backhand. And I've noticed a lot of errors, uh, resulting out of that on their part. Like, okay. So that ball, the deuce court? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So that uh, that seems to help. Um, and the other thing is I'm going um, just cross court at the, you know, at the tape, um, the center strap mm -hmm. and uh, the majority of the time, I'm just trying to give us a little bit more margin. So taking a little bit fewer risks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, um, I, I think a really good kind of primary pattern is going at that center net strap, you know, um, even if somebody poaches uh if you hit a good return a lot of the time it, it's still going to be a pretty difficult volley and it, it's always best to make them go ahead and beat you a few times before you make that adjustment right and then um the secondary pattern that you mentioned is, is going down the line in the deuce court you're right it's it's great to go with the backhand volley rather than going for the all-out winner because going for that all out winner, you'll make maybe three out of 10 or so. But if you can play with a little higher margin, you go at the backhand volley, force a lot of errors. Um, or if they do make it, or are you finding that they'll just kind of pop the ball up and you can finish it on the next ball or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed that. And then um, on the ad side, when I'm receiving, um, you had a tip about, um, going towards the kind of towards the middle of the court between the net player and then towards the um towards the the uh, the baseline player and sure. i've seen that work a few times too when i've executed it better so that they're kind of stabbing at it and missing and then i've seen where the that kind of distracts the baseline player and they don't get it either so it's yeah a kind of a sweet spot to hit absolutely yeah that's a really good strategy for returns and even volleys or any approach shots so any type of short ball if you hit it kind of low at that backhand volley and get the person to kind of reach for it um, you can force a lot of errors that way uh, and cause some miscommunication for sure um, so any any other uh, ground stroke strategies so we talked about returns anything from the back of the court that you're thinking about that you weren't thinking about before I think I'm more confident sticking with a high percentage shot strategy longer. Like, I'm, um, you know, I've, I'm definitely a little bit more of a predictable player and been given advice in the past to make sure that I'm, you know, putting in surprises, right. Not being hundred percent predictable, but I think recently I'm more comfortable trying to force the error on them and putting less pressure on myself um, to be able to do it. I do think we're getting, now that we're playing more aggressively at the net, I also throw in a lot more lobbing. Um, I've been doing a lot more lobbing recently, which I really am surprised, Will, that you didn't open this podcast with the lob last name joke that we get every <laughs> tennis match. <laughs> so, and, I, and, I, and sadly, I can't lob at all. So it's <laughs> horrible. Yeah. So um, I definitely do more of that. Um, for me, a big part is just putting a lot less pressure on myself every shot. Like, so I think one of your podcasts, you really stress like the one point at a time. And I lean on that most of the match. Like when I'm returning, I'm standing there and I'm like this, this point, not last point, not next point, this point, and just kind of really focus on that. Sure. Yeah. What's, the other thing um, I know. Okay. Go ahead. I was just going to say from the, on the baseline, um, the two things I'm doing differently are looking for more opportunities to come in, um, mm -hmm. and, and attack the net. 
where before I would be a little bit more hesitant to do that and I would get into uh, more like baseline rallies. Um, and then the other thing is just kind of being a little bit more conservative, I would say, and letting my uh, partner at the net get an opportunity to poach um, when I'm staying back there. So like Cindy reminded me last night, like, cause I hit a few long and she's like, just, you know, aim for the, you know, a more conservative target and we'll get sure. a chance to, to end the point faster. Sure. So, so when you say more conservative from the baseline, does that mean uh, hitting with less pace or redirecting down the line less or something else? Yeah, both of those things. Um, like okay. like uh, last night, for example, I was really trying to get more of a top spin um, forehand going and it wasn't like I was, I was having trouble executing that shot last night like a real heavy top spin forehand and Cindy noticed that and she was like just you know take a little bit off of it yeah. And, yeah. and let them make an error instead yeah. of you know going deep yeah he's like I'm going for a spin and I'm like we don't need it just get it in aim yeah. for the service line yeah because we're leaning more on our net game we're not trying to hit as many winners from the baseline right yeah there's um I, I'll have to get the stat uh so Craig O'Shaughnessy, who I've had on the podcast before, um, he did a doubles analysis at the pro level and the percentage of winners hit from the baseline versus the net was like, it was something like 95% at the net and like 5% at the baseline or something. So it's like, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, and you really do see a lot of players anywhere from 3035 all the way up to four five trying to go for that down the line winner so much and hit the ball as hard as they can. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's kind of a self-defeating strategy a lot of the yeah. time. Yeah. So what's a, uh, Cindy, you mentioned you've, you've started lobbing a little bit more, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. What's a scenario where you're doing that now versus uh, before? Um, I think the two, if I see both of them in, Mm -hmm. I'll do it. Whereas before I would try and I wouldn't trust my lob. So I would try and just brute force, like hit it at them and hope for the best. So sure. now I might just try and cause a little chaos and lob over them if I can. Um, I have been pretty successful to just lobbing over the net player and trying to make the baseline player run around a little bit more, cause a little bit more chaos that way. Got it. Okay. Off the return as well, or not as much? Um, yeah, actually, I have been hitting some laps on my return of serve as well. Nice. Awesome. Okay. Um, let's see. So what... <laughs> and we're getting a visitor. Our dog just walked in. So. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> no problem. He'll, he'll get some air time. Um, <laughs> so, so what do you all feel like is next for your improvement? What do, what do you feel like is... Um, like you're working on right now that you need to kind of get to that next level? Yeah, uh, for me, it's the mental game. Um, number one, like I said, on the, like getting tense on a tie break, for example, um, you know, using those techniques that you just described uh, recently, you know, focusing on what's happening in the environment instead, or, you know, sure. your feet or whatever. Um, those are the kind of things I feel like, I need to work on for sure. Yeah. Right. And a lot of that comes from repetition for sure. So, you know, if, if you're playing more and getting, putting yourself in more of those pressure, pressure situations, you'll get more used to dealing with those nerves. They, of course, they're not going to go away, but definitely using some of those techniques. Um, thinking of your feet was from Jeff Greenwald, who uh, has a website called Fearless Tennis. Um, and yeah, and just like appreciating the moment and the environment you're in and things like that uh, can definitely help. Um, what about you, Cindy? Any specific skills you feel like you uh, want to add to your game? Yeah. So, well, I want to start by saying one of the good things we got from your podcast is like we now have a better language to talk to each other because even last night 
I was saying, oh, like my mental fitness <laughs> needs more work, right? And I think that was from one of your podcasts where you went through, like, there's a difference. You, you need your physical fitness, you need your mental fitness. So Dan, you know, you talked about like wanting to improve that mental game. I think I definitely still have some room for like improving my overall physical fitness. Um, you know, like last night and it was an unusual match because it was very competitive. It we went to deuce a lot, which is a curiosity question that we have for you is like, what would you tell us about a match where mm, I would say 90% of the points went to multiple deuces. Um, it was a really tight competitive match. And like, we were two and a half hours in and I was just like, I'm tired. Like I'm having a lot of trouble <laughs> just because I'm tired before dinner too. Yeah. So, um, so th that's definitely a top of mind with some recency bias of something I want to improve. Um, but in general, for me, I just want to keep practicing. I feel like I'm on a good trajectory. I'm seeing a lot of success following your advice. So, um, I really just want to keep practicing it. Awesome. Great. Um, so do y'all have any questions for me or requests for the audience even? Yeah. So the first question is, what do you do in a match when you go to deuce 90% of the time? What is that? So what are we like, we talked about trying to end the points earlier and we would try, but we, it just wasn't working. So what else should we have been talking about? Yeah. I'd, I've never really thought about like a strategy for not going to deuce. I, I don't think that, uh, that there's anything necessarily to do differently because it, it's, it just means that y'all are like really evenly matched, right? Um, yeah, a few times we went to deuce like eight times or nine times, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, on the one point and we're like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think in the tiebreaker podcast, I mentioned um, people, a lot of people talk about different strategies during tiebreakers and then, you know, deuce games are really pressure points and things like that. But uh really it's the, the rules are all the same whether it's like deuce add nine eight in a tiebreaker or 40 love right the court's the same size uh the players on the court are the same all the rules are the same so you're still using your same strategies to uh, try to win each individual point right so i don't think there's a whole lot to to change there um you can have some go-to uh strategies on big points um, mm. so for me for example uh, and I'm gonna have to change this because everybody's gonna find out but um, <laughs> uh, recently over the past probably year or so if it's a big point like 40 30 on my serve and it's we're down four or five and I'm serving and it's it's 40 30 and I need this point to close out the game and get it to five all um, I will hit a uh, a big flat serve but right down the middle of the box and that's the only time I use that. So yeah. the opponent, the opponent hasn't seen it all match. Maybe they've seen it once or something like that. Cause I've been going for the wide serve, the T serve, um, or like a slice into the body, which, um, depending on your skill level, you can, you know, vary different things. Right. Uh, but if they've only seen it maybe once in the whole match, and then I hit a flat serve right in the middle of the box. And I choose that because it's just a higher percentage than trying to hit a flat serve wide or down the tee. Um, it really surprises them. And I force a lot of return errors that way. So if you can think of maybe kind of a go-to play like that, that you only use a handful of times, um, something like that could work. Uh, I guess the issue with that potentially is that, you know, if it's such a good play for you, you should probably want to use it more often, right? So that's true. It's, it's kind of this balance. Uh, um, and I wish I had a better answer for you, but yeah, I mean, it sounds like it was just a really competitive match. It was a good match. It was like even losing, it, it felt good after. I was proud of the way we played because it was it was, a, yeah, it it was, was a, a competitive battle. It felt good. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's something. Um, that's something that I would love people to take away is like, you know, especially people like us who like none of us get paid to play tennis. Um, we're all out there just like having fun and we can control what we do as far as like our strategy and do the best we can with our mental game. But if we're having a bad day with like our forehand or backhand or volleys or something like that, like just kind of take it easy on yourself because yeah. 
we're, we don't play enough for it to really matter. Um, so I, I think that's good that you're like thinking about the strategy a lot more and then thinking about um, even if we lose, oh, there's the puppy. Um, <laughs> e even if we do lose, you know, we, we did everything we could uh, and we enjoyed it out there. Yeah, it feels good. And, and like trying to apply things that we're learning and, and kind of ticking the boxes on, you know, have we tried this? Have we tried that? It, it feels good that now we have some things that we can, we know we can go to uh, throughout a match. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. Any, any other questions before we hop off? I mean, we talk about you the whole time, the whole match. We're like, what would Will tell us to do? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all should get a camera and film one of the matches. We can, we can do like an analysis or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that would be great. We yeah. talked about that, but I don't know if I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, we, we will maybe, do it. Maybe down the road. <laughs> no, we'll commit to doing it because then that'll be even more. But I do think that actually on the last parting thought, my game has changed enough. I used to be really intimidated by spectators and I like it, it made me nervous. I felt like people were watching how bad I was and I don't feel that way anymore. I played a women's match on Sunday and I looked up at one point and Dan and our son were watching and, and I was like, yeah, Hey, you know, like I waved and I'm like, look at me, I'm doing really good. <laughs> and like, I, you know, they saw some really good points and it was a really good match. And I just think the overall confidence that I have on the court now is so different than where I was because I was putting so much pressure on myself that I had to be better. And as soon as I realized it, like, I just needed to make them be worse, which sounds a little awful when you say it out loud, but it works really well. Yeah, it works better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So most of tennis, whether it's singles or doubles, most points end in an error. So when you realize that you really want to focus on forcing errors a lot more, um, yeah. that's something else I've, I've learned from uh, Craig O'Shaughnessy, um, who I'll, I'll link to that episode in the show notes as well. Um, so one last, uh, question for y'all or, or one last thing I want to talk about, um, do y'all practice a lot or do y'all just mostly play in these league matches? Um, historically we, we practice at least weekly once mm -hmm. a week. So okay. like we have a ball machine, we'll use that. Um, we have our boys play and some friends, uh, so we'll get down and we'll probably, you know, a couple hours a week practice um and we'll do kind of some drill type practice and some just work on our our mm -hmm. mechanics yeah sure but it's about once a week and i just came off of i had a, a, a surgery so i've been out for six weeks and i walked out of that six week hiatus into a match and was mm -hmm. fine using this strategy. And I think yeah, it was because good. we were focused more on strategy than my, and my form was off. My timing was off. I was definitely yeah. missing uh, baseline shots that I normally would make, but the using the strategy, it covered us enough that even with a six week hiatus, we were fine. Sure. Yeah. So, so there's, I guess, two, two ways to improve um, in tennis or in doubles. One is, is the strategy, which y'all are clearly working on. Um, and then the other that I talked about is, is technique, which I don't really teach a lot of. Um, but one thing, the reason I asked if you practice is one thing you can focus on, because when I, when I asked both of you, what do you need to work on next? Both of you talked a lot about kind of the mental side of the game. And um, that really does come with a lot of just repetition. Um, there's definitely some techniques that we've talked about uh, but the other thing is in practice matches, kind of expanding your comfort zone. And I've got a, a blog post on that. I think it's called the Nadal practice strategy. Um, so when I was watching the U.S. Open a few years ago, I'm going to go ahead and summarize the blog post. Uh, Darren Cahill was calling the match on Nadal. And he said, if you ever watch Nadal practice, he misses like almost every ball because he's trying to go for shots that expand his ability mm -hmm. that, that expand his comfort zone. So when I heard that, I was like, Oh, that makes so much sense. So when you're in a practice match and, and this goes for anybody listening, 
try strategies that maybe make you a little uncomfortable. Um, obviously, if they're not winning strategies, don't, don't do that. But uh, strategies that make you a little uncomfortable, maybe try serves that make you a little uncomfortable. If you get on the ball machine, you know, hit, hit shots that kind of expand your, your ability. Um, Dan, you mentioned that you, you're not very good at lobbing. So maybe go out there on the ball machine and start working on that. Even if it's a little uncomfortable, it's just another tool you can add to your game to keep improving. Yeah, I need to do that. <laughs> it gets really embarrassing when our last name's Lob and our lobs go out. So we try and focus on that. I, that joke didn't even cross my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, one of the things is that we we historically, we put in so many hours on technique um, mm -hmm. on the court and, and yeah. practicing. So for us, this is like all new, just thinking like strategically mm -hmm. and um, thinking about movement and the mental yeah. game, it's all kind of new to us, but it's been so impactful. We're like really excited yeah. about it right now. <laughs> and I'm sure all those years of lessons and working on the technique is like foundational and helping us, right? Cause we can make most shots at this point. So we're not, really struggling to keep the ball in the court. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful we spent the time, but I'm really happy that we finally have figured out how to use all those hours towards success in a match. Sure. Yeah, technique enables good strategy. Uh, and technique, it you know, we're all professionals at not playing tennis. So technique is hard to improve because uh, we only have so many hours in the day. Yes. So um, Awesome. Well, any, any last requests or advice for the audience? Um, I mean, focus on the opponent more than yourself is my best advice. That's my biggest takeaway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One thing, you know, Cindy, cause we're trying to get into that mindset of being um, good observers of our opponents. And so one thing she has us do now is like instantly try to identify are they left-handed or right-handed? Uh, and that kind of like, as soon as we start, we, that's the first thing we look for. And then we kind of, that kind of sets the tone of, all right, we're going to be observant, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's helped us. Yeah. And yeah, I just absolutely. played three matches in a row against the lefty, which is like crazy. Wow. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but I think that helps. And I think the other big thing, the things that we say to each other during matches now that we didn't before, the common phrases, Dan will look at me and say lateral movement at the net. He'll just like remind me lateral movement, lateral movement, um, like pinch the middle, we'll say to each other. And then the other thing is what can we change? We are much faster to make a change now than we have ever been um, going to back you know, is too up working? Do we need to stay at the service line? Um, sure. Being much more flexible about what we're doing. Is yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think a lot of that um, kind of staying observant, like you said, Dan, enables that uh, ability to quickly change, right? You notice things quicker. So having that kind of self-awareness on the court is probably the best advice you can give someone in doubles, um, really yeah. to stay observant of all that. And then if we, if we lose the first set, we, we make more drastic changes. We're like, yeah. uh, we switch sides, you know, mm -hmm. if I'm on the east side, switch to the ad, you know, yeah. we just kind of really start shaking things up. Yeah. We don't want to go home and wonder if we had made a change, if it would have made a difference, we would rather make the change. And even if the change doesn't work, we know we've done everything we could have done to try and right. affect the match. That's a really good way to look at it. Yeah. Like no regrets. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming on. Um, and once you film that match, send it in and we'll, okay. we'll take a look at it. Maybe have we're you playing on Friday. So uh, on again. that would be great. Yeah. We're playing some uh, people, a couple that we've played three times before. Um, Cause there's a couple of different leagues in Atlanta and this is a one that matches you up with five matches. So mm -hmm. um, we've played them two or three times. We've never won, but we also have never played them have not played them in a year and a half. So um, maybe that'll be a good one to film. Nice. Let yeah. me know how it goes. I want to hear about that. Okay. okay. We will. Awesome. awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Well. Thank you all. If you like that video, be sure to click the thumbs up button below to help support the channel. And for even more gear reviews, 
double strategies, and interviews with pro tennis players and coaches, don't forget to subscribe to our channel as well. And to sign up for our newsletter where you'll get double strategies and discounts on the latest tennis gear, go to thetennistribe.com.